all this conversation around graphs, the shapes of graphs, when the derivative equals 0 to find key points, has a very important application. And that is in what we call the applied optimization problems. So our question that we're going to attempt to answer is how do we optimize or find the most efficient, the fastest, the biggest, the smallest? How do we optimize a value of interest? And ultimately, what we're really asking is when does the derivative equal 0? Because that's the peak or the valley. That's the optimal point for the most efficient or most profit or least expense or shortest distance or shortest time that we're trying to get after. So let's take a look at a few of these classic optimization problems. And then from there, you should be able to solve lots of different types of optimization problems. The first classic problem is what we call the rectangle problem. where we're generally trying to either minimize the perimeter, maximize the area, something related to that effect. So let's say a farmer has 80 feet of fencing to enclose a pasture. along a rock wall. What that means is he only has to actually fence three sides of the wall, not all four sides of the wall. So what dimensions would maximize the area? So let's draw a picture to kind of see what's going on. We've got this rock wall already. And what this farmer's going to do is he's going to make a fence that goes alongside that rock wall. So he's really only fencing three sides. And we need to give variables to the sides as we calculate the area, because that's what we want to maximize. So we'll say it's an x by y fence, which means the other side's also x if we're thinking about perimeter. And we know that the area of any rectangle is equal to the length times the width, or in this case, x times the y. But that gives us two variables. So we need to constrain one of those variables so that we can switch, reduce it down to one variable. And that's going to come from the limit we're given, is that we have 80 feet of fencing available to us. Well, if there's 80 feet available to us, that means the total distance, x plus y plus x, or 2x plus y, that total distance has to equal the 80 feet of fencing. Well, the easiest variable to solve for here would probably be y. So we'll subtract 2x. And we'll say that y is equal to 80 minus 2x. And we'll replace the y in our area formula to be 80 minus the 2x. To make life easier, we'll go ahead and distribute. So area is equal to 80x minus 2x squared. And we want to maximize this area. So if we think about maybe the graph of the area, the area is going to increase to a certain point and then come down after that point. We're looking to find that maximum point, And we know at that point, the slope of the derivative is equal to 0. So let's find the derivative of the area in terms of x. The derivative of the area is equal to 80 minus 4x. And we just need to make that equal to 0 to find the critical point where this fence area is optimized. Add the 4x to both sides, and 80 equals 4x. Divide both sides by 4 and x is equal to 20. 
Now that we know where that maximum occurs, we plug that in for x in the y equals equation. y equals 80 minus 2 times 20, or 80 minus 40, which is 40. So for the farmer to maximize the area of his three-sided fence along the rock wall, he should do a 20 foot by 40 foot fence. And I think fence actually has a C in it. So 20 foot by 40 foot fence. And that's the idea of the rectangle problem. Let's try another problem. This is probably one of the most classic problems of all calculus. What I'm going to call the run and swim problem. And rather than write this all out, I'm just going to kind of draw a picture and narrate what I'm talking about. We've got this river. That's water. Does that look like a river? We've got this river. And a person is on one side of the river. And he wants maybe a pot of gold that's on the other side of the river. It is going to be 9 miles down the river is where that pot of gold is. But the river is also 2 miles wide. What this person can do is he's going to run along the river a ways. Then he's going to jump in the water and swim diagonally across a ways. What we want to know is how far should he run, so we'll call the running x, before he starts swimming in order to get to that pot of gold in the most efficient, quickest way possible. Well, we need to know a few things about this person. Uh, let's say the person runs 6 miles per hour and swims 3 miles per hour. So how far should the person run Let's write out the question. How far should the person run before swimming? Well, let's see if we can get a little more information on this. Um, the swim distance, let's call that swim distance y. So we've got it labeled. And then we're going to have this gap here on this right triangle. We already know the height of the triangles too, but that gap, if the total distance from the person to the pot of gold is 9, and he runs or she runs x, it's going to be 9 minus x is what's going to be left horizontally. give ourselves a little bit more workspace. Well, we should remember that the formula for distance is equal to rate times time. And we're trying to minimize the time. So let's go ahead and solve this for time. And we'll say time is equal to the total distance divided by the rate. And we know that the person is going to be running at a rate of 6 miles per hour. So the run time is going to be the distance, we don't know x, divided by the rate, or 6 miles per hour. While the swim time is going to be the distance divided by the rate. The swim time, the y, the diagonal, we don't know or the swim distance, the y, the diagonal, we don't know. But we do know the rate at which the person swims is 3 miles per hour. So the total time is equal to the sum of these things, x over 6 plus y over 3. 
The other thing we're going to use to our advantage is we have a right triangle formed on the edge of the river. Pythagorean theorem tells us that 9 minus x squared plus the height, which is 2 squared, is equal to the swim distance, which is y squared. Doing a little simplifying, squaring the 2 uh, gives us 4. But we want to get rid of the y squared. So taking the square root of both sides, we'll have 9 minus x squared plus 4 under the square root is equal to y. So let's replace the y in our time equation with that information. Time is equal to x over 6 plus the square root of 9 minus x squared plus 4 over 3. This time is what we want to minimize. In other words, the graph here is going to come down to some point, And we need to find out what point has a slope of 0 on its tangent line. And the way we do that is we take the derivative and set the derivative equal to 0. Square roots are a little bit more work to take the derivative of. So let's actually rewrite this with a 1 half power. So we have x over 6 plus the 9 minus x squared plus 4 to the 1 half power over 3, because that's going to be easier to take a derivative of. So the derivative of the time, the derivative of x over 6 is just 1 over 6 plus Let's make a big fraction, and we'll do this piece by piece. First, the 1 is a constant, so that's going to be out front. We can bring the exponent of 1 half out front as we take the derivative, which means we've got a 2 in the denominator and a 1 in the numerator. Then we reduce the exponent by 1, which makes it to the negative 1 half power. The negative 1 half power, the negative exponent, moves it down to the denominator. So now we've got 9 minus x squared plus 4 to the 1 half, but in the denominator because of the negative exponent. Then we have to multiply by the derivative of the inside using our chain rule. So we've got uh, this little piece, the 9 minus x squared, that we can take the derivative of, brings the 2 out front times the 9 minus x. Reduce the exponent by 1, just leaves 9 minus x. And then we have to multiply by the derivative of inside that. And the derivative of negative x is negative 1. Let's see if we can clean that up a little bit. What I notice is we've got 2's that divide out, which is nice. So oh, let's take this negative and do a positive times a negative as a negative. So we've got 1 sixth minus, we're left with the 9 minus x in the numerator. Let's do this in brown, actually. It's a better color. We've got 1 sixth minus 9 minus x is left in the numerator. And that's it, so I don't really need the parentheses over 3. And let's go ahead and take that 1 half and make it back into a square root times 9 minus x squared plus 4. And we know when this derivative equals 0, we've got our minimum time. Switch over to purple. We're going to add that first fraction to the other, that second fraction to the other side giving us 1 sixth equals 9 minus x over 3 square roots of 9 minus x squared plus 4. We now have two equal fractions. We can solve two equal fractions by multiplying the diagonals. 
1 times 3 times the square root is 3 square roots of 9 minus x squared plus 4 equals 6 times 9 minus x. So I'll go back to blue here as we solve. Square root's going to be annoying, so let's square both sides. Actually, blue's a bad color. Let's do green to get a little more contrast. Square both sides. And we know when we square both sides, because it's all multiplying, we square the pieces. 3 squared is 9. Squaring the square root gets rid of it. So it's 9 times 9 minus x squared plus 4 equals 6 squared is 36 times 9 minus x squared. Let's distribute the 9 onto both parts here. It will give us 9 times the 9 minus x squared plus 9 times 4 is 36 equals 36 times 9 minus x squared. And if we keep the 9 minus x squareds as a group, we see we've got 36 of them on the right and 9 of them on the left. To make life easier, let's subtract 9 of these 9 minus x squareds from both sides. And that tells us that 36 equals 27 of these 9 minus x squareds. Divide both sides by 27. 36 over 27 reduces to 4 thirds equals 9 minus x squared. Get rid of the squared with the square root of both sides, and we get 2 over the square root of 3 equals 9 minus x. And I'm going to add x to both sides and subtract. Oops, it's plus or minus 2 root 3. Sorry, that's important. If we add x to both sides and add and subtract the 2 root 3 from both sides, we get an x is equal to 9 plus or minus 2 divided by the square root of 3. Pulling up our calculator to take a look at this, we've got 9 plus 2 divided by the square root of 3 is one answer. But what you notice is that gives us 10.15. Going back to the original, the whole distance was only 9. If I go 10.15, I'm actually going past my pot of gold and having to go backwards. That's not the best strategy to go about. So we probably don't want that solution. So let's try again. And we're going to do 9 minus 2 divided by the square root of 3. And we find out x, the distance we should run, is about 7.85. So this person's a really good runner. He's going to run 7.85 miles before the person jumps into the water, and either she or he will swim the rest of the way. So now we know she or he's going to run 7.85 miles, jump in the water, and swim the rest of the way to the pot of gold. That'll be the quickest way to get to the pot of gold. That's the run and swim problem. Another classic problem is what I like to call the hallway problem. The hallway problem is best illustrated with a picture. The idea is you've got a hallway that goes around a corner. But the width of the hallway is not the same on both sides. Maybe on one side, the hallway is 10 feet long. And on the other side, the hallway is 8 feet long. And the question becomes, 
how long of a piece of furniture, maybe some long picture, can you get around that corner in this hallway as you move into the apartment around the corner? Let's go ahead and write that out. What is the longest piece of furniture to fit around the corner. Well, to set this up, we need a little bit more information on here. One thing we're going to be interested in is what is the angle theta that we're going to be at in order to maximize our distance. Now, we know from geometry, if I extend the wall from the top side across, this vertical angle across from it is going to have the exact same measurement. So we get a triangle to the left. And if I drop a line down, we have a triangle to the right. We actually have two similar triangles. But one has a height of 8 feet, and the other one has a base of 10 feet. Also, we're interested in the pieces of this furniture length. So we're going to label the left side x and the top right side y. And we know that the total length of my furniture is equal to x plus y. But we don't like having two variables. So we have to try and use our relationships to reduce it down to one variable. And actually, that one variable is going to be neither x or y. It's going to be theta, the angle that connects them both. With the 10-foot triangle, from the theta, we have the adjacent side and the hypotenuse that we're working with. That means we're going to use the cosine over there. We know that the cosine of theta is 10 over x. And with the other theta on the y, we've got the opposite side and the hypotenuse. That tells us that the sine of theta is equal to 8 over y. Solving both these equations for x and y, we multiply by x and divide by the cosine. x is equal to 10 over the cosine of theta. And y is equal to 8 over the sine of theta. But rather than dealing with the reciprocals of cosine and sine, let's just use the reciprocal trig functions. And we'll say that x is equal to 10 secant of theta. And y is equal to 8 cosecant of theta. Now we can replace x and y with these pieces. And we've been reduced down to one variable. The length is equal to 10 secant theta. plus the y, which is 8 cosecant of theta. Now we've got our function. We're just looking for the spot that maximizes our distance, or our size of our furniture, where the slope is equal to 0. So we'll take the derivative. L prime is equal to, let's do this in a different color. Let's go to brown. L prime is equal to 10. The derivative of secant is secant tangent. Secant theta tangent theta plus 8. The derivative of cosecant is negative cosecant cotangent. So instead of plus 8, let's say minus 8 cosecant cotangent theta. And all we need to know is when this equation equals 
0. Well, let's start by moving the negative part over to the right side. So we've got 10 secant theta tangent theta equals 8 cosecant theta cotangent theta. And probably the easiest way to solve this would be to change this all into sines and cosines, since we're more familiar with sines and cosines, and seeing if we can establish um, what's happening here. So we'll make a fraction. 10's in the numerator. Secant is 1 over cosine, so it's 10 over. We've got a cosine theta. Tangent is sine over cosine. So we've got a sine theta over cosine. Cosine times cosine is cosine squared equals a fraction for the right side. 8 cosecant is 1 over sine. So that puts a sine theta in the denominator. And cotangent is cosine over sine. So cosine theta over sine theta. But we already have a sine theta. So now it's sine theta or sine squared theta. Let's clear out the fractions by doing the cross multiply trick we've done before. So we've got 10 sine times sine squared is sine cubed theta equals 8 cosine cubed theta. Let's move the numbers to one side and the variables to the other side. We're more comfortable with tangent, which is sine over cosine. So let's move the cosines to the right, We're gonna, or to the left. We're going to divide both sides by cosine cubed theta. And we'll move the numbers to the right by dividing both sides by 10. Sine cubed over cosine cubed is tangent cubed. The cosine cubes are gone. 8 over 10 reduces to 4 fifths. Get rid of the cube with the cube root of both sides. And then tangent of theta, our angle, is the cubed root of 4 fifths. So theta is equal to the tangent inverse of the cube root of 4 fifths. Or to make it easier on our, well, yeah, let's just type that in our calculator. Let's find out what theta, our angle, is equal to. We want to do the tangent inverse of the cubed root, which is conveniently under math. Option number four is a cubed root of 4 fifths. And the tangent inverse of the cubed root of 4 fifths is 0 But if you remember our picture, our picture wasn't interested in the angle, 0.7482 radians. That's what we just found is that angle. We're interested in how long is the x and how long is the y, which means we have to come back to our x equals and our y equals equations in order to find those pieces. So we have x is equal to 10 over the cosine of our angle, which is 0.7482. And y is equal to 8 over the sine of our angle, which is 0.7482. Fortunately, our calculator can do that for us quite nicely. So we've got 10 divided by the cosine of 0.7482. And so that x distance is going to be 13.64. For our y distance, 8 divided by the sine of 0.7482. 
That y distance is 11.76. So for our final answer, the total length of my furniture that can fit around the corner, the 13.64 plus 11.76 is going to be 25.4 feet. I can fit anything that's 25.4 feet long around this corner. If it's any longer, it won't fit. I can't take it into my new apartment. And that's how we solve the hallway problem. So these applied optimization problems can come in many different forms, but the philosophy is always the same. Find out some relationship between the variables, take the derivative, and set that derivative equal to 0. And we can optimize, either maximize or minimize, depending on the context, almost any situation. Take a look at a few and try a few, and we will discuss it more in class.